so first i'll talk on the internet so the internet has made knowledge and opportunities more democratized than it was years back so you can use your phone and if you're trying to come to grad school actually do research on schools in different countries that offer the course you want to take if you need funding you also look out for schools that offer funding take note of the application deadlines and try to send in your application for me the route i used was um, reaching out to professors still from the internet reading their papers and sending cold emails to them, offering to work in their lab um, and have them fund me for grad school. Nice. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's not easy because sometimes they won't respond to you or they don't have space in their lab, they don't have money or things, you know, there are rejections over and over again, but you don't want to give up. My guest today is a computer science graduate first from the University of Rio in Nigeria, and then currently as an advanced degree candidate at the University of Denver in the USA. Even with her technical academic background, she almost opted out of the field completely until an internship experience where she happened to work in close proximity with the data team. She began to see roles beyond the standard developer engineer and the opportunities possible, especially within the world of data. She's currently completing an internship with Microsoft as a data scientist and also runs a personal blog herself. My guest today is Anya Khan Yang. Welcome to the show, Anya Khan. How are you doing today? I'm fine. Thank you so much, me, for having me on the show. How are you doing as well? I'm great. So excited to have you on the show, Anya Khan. Um, I love hearing about your journey. And I think it's quite interesting that you started off in tech, computer science, but then you almost decided to, you know, go complete business on us and then you came back to tech. So why yeah. don't you tell us about your journey, even from when you decided to put yourself on that computer science path as an undergrad, what you know caused um, those, those moments to basically unfold? Okay, um, thank you, me. So I am Nigerian, I grew up in Nigeria. <laughs> My parents are African parents and I used to do well at school. I do well at school. So I wanted to be a doctor, a medical doctor. It was like an unsaid expectation of children then. So I went with that career in my head for a while. But when I got to secondary school or high school for some countries, I realized that I didn't like biological sciences. I was more of a physical science person, especially computing and mathematics. Um, so I started looking for careers that you know, were in line with my interests and my skills. Some of the careers I considered were chemical engineering, petrochemical engineering, computer science and engineering, mathematics as well. I, I considered getting like a bachelor's in maths at some point. So but I made more hard sciences, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for different reasons, I decided not to do the different courses and I stopped with computer science because I was privileged to have people that had studied computer science and different other, you know, careers or courses at university and I saw the kind of work they did so I was privileged to see the kind of work the computer scientists did and he was a programmer and I realized that I, I wanted to be a programmer I wanted to build stuff for the for the computer or for computers I've, I loved using computers I was also privileged to get like my first computer not my personal computer but a computer that my entire family shared as at, at about age seven um, so I was privileged to you know have the opportunity to work with the computer from early on. So I wanted to write software for the, for the computers, for people to use on their computers. And that's why I opted to study computer science in my undergrad. It wasn't the easiest decision to make and to convince my parents because they were worried for me. They were, they were scared. They were like, I hope you're going to come out and get a job. You're not just going to work in like a cyber cafe, which is a business center in Nigeria. Yeah. Um, because I, I grew up in a small town, Kuyo, and there weren't many companies um, you doing tech stuff then. So they were worried for me and I assured them that I was going to be fine. <laughs> and they let me do it. So I did my computer science undergrad for five years at the University of Kuyo. Um, I went through the school process just passing my courses and I didn't really pick any skills to be honest but in my fourth year I had a one-year internship and I actually spent it doing business so I used to sell phone accessories on Instagram and it was doing quite well and I thought that I would complete my undergrad because I had one year left and I wouldn't work in tech anymore I would just like start a business open a few businesses here and there and be a business babe 
Um, so I, 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 I somehow convinced myself not to drop out and to complete my final year of university. And while I, when I completed my final year, I had a friend who spoke to me when I finished school and, and was like, what's next for me? And I, I didn't know. So I was like, I don't know. I'm just here. I'm at home. I'm resting at my parents' house. And um, he asked me to come join his team. So I joined his team as a social media associate because, as I said, I didn't have any tech skills from school that I could apply in industry. I just had like theory, foundations, but I couldn't apply anything. So I joined as a social media associate because I was pretty good with social media then, running ads and stuff. These are skills I picked from running my own business on Instagram and making sales. So I started working for his company as a social media associate. And then I met the data science team at the company. And I was so excited to actually see that I could combine my passion of technology and business because I'm someone that likes business. I like numbers. I like thinking about the product. I like strategy. So the typical web development, software engineering, maybe product design route wasn't really doing it for me. And unfortunately, that was what I saw around me at that time in Uyo. So that's why I felt like tech wasn't for me because the, the roles and the routes I was seeing then did not fit into what I wanted to be. So I thought, you know, tech is not for me. So just finding out about data science via the data science team, the projects that we're working on, tasks, I was so excited. And um, he was kind enough to let me switch from being a social media associate to a data science intern. And I started training, um, taking courses and just practicing. Wow, wow. You sound extremely resourceful yourself. So tell us a little bit about how did you make that crossover from a practical perspective? So for someone that, you know, is just reading and sort of like getting into the field and trying to understand it, what sort of practical steps did you take? What courses did you take? Did you do any specific projects? Could you share a little bit more about that journey? Okay. Um, so I think data science is very broad. There are different areas I would say it can be applied so there's the popular ones like computer vision natural natural language processing knowledge representation recommendation systems among others I think the first step is knowing what you might be interested in I don't expect you to be very clear okay I want to be this because you wouldn't know if you don't try but it's okay to have an idea on have an idea of what you know you would like to try out for me, it was natural language processing and recommendation systems because that's what the company I was working at was solving. Like that's the problem they were solving. So I naturally inclined towards that because I was learning on the job. For you, it might be computer vision, maybe something else. So first finding that because the libraries you use are actually different. So you don't go learning, trying to learn everything that you don't actually need or need at the moment and you don't overwhelm yourself with information. So first defining the area you want to apply the data science skill at, and then finding courses for that. I took online courses, so Coursera, EDX, um, Udemy, those are the three I can remember, right? So those platforms check for courses that solve the problem you want to learn. So if you want to learn about recommendation systems, in my case, you look for a course for that, read the reviews. You can also use social media and ask people for recommendations as well, if you want to learn about image contouring or something like that, look for a specific course that solves that because they tend to go more in depth and you can also apply it. Again, as you're learning, don't just fall into tutorial purgatory of you know, learning and taking tutorials without actually practicing. So you want to be practicing on the side, actually writing code by yourself and not just watching it. You want to have like a personal project, no matter how little that applies what you have learned. And it also helps to put yourself out there. So in 2018, when I first started learning like this is science, I did this thing on Twitter called 50 Days of Learning, where I was trying to learn. I was trying to be intentional about learning something new every day for 50 days, and I was sharing it. Knowing that I had committed to share to the public, I knew I had to get up every day and learn something because I wasn't going to lie. And I didn't want to also break you know, my promising quotes. It was difficult sometimes. You know, Some days you just want to sleep in or you have to go out, but you still have to come back and learn something because you want to share. So sharing also you know, helps me, helps keep me accountable. I mean, nobody asked me, nobody sent me, but it's something that works for me. And I had my blog as well. I used to write and share articles as I was learning. So, yeah. Fantastic. So how does someone, you see, you know, you did your first degree in a developing country and now you find yourself 
in a developed market like the US, in a company like Microsoft. I think there are people out there that, you know, will aspire to want to maybe, you know, replicate or in some way the journey that you've been on, they would aspire to be there. How did you make that leap from Nigeria to the US? And how did you position yourself um, for an opportunity um, like Microsoft as well? If you share your insights, that would be great. Okay. Uh, I would say that we are, in, well, we are privileged, like we're in privileged times. The internet and having computers and phones are so, so helpful. Sometimes we tend to underestimate the power of these things. Although they can be used like in a negative way, the positives are also very great. So first I'll talk on the internet. So the internet has made knowledge and opportunities more democratized than it was years back. So you can use your phone and if you're trying to come to grad school, actually do research on schools in different countries that offer the course you want to take. If you need funding, you also look out for schools that offer funding, take note of the application deadlines and try to send in your application. For me, the route I used was um, reaching out to professors, still from the internet, reading their papers and sending cold emails to them, offering to work in their lab um, and have them fund me for grad school. Nice. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's not easy because sometimes they won't respond to you or they don't have space in their lab, we don't have money or things, you know, there are rejections over and over again, but you don't want to give up. Um, so yeah, use the internet. Also by Microsoft, I would also say the internet because I actually had a friend refer me. My friend works in Microsoft Lagos and he referred me for three roles and I interviewed and I scaled through for one of them. Um, but I met this friend on Twitter. So yeah, I think the internet is so powerful. Um, be mindful of what you put out. Like don't just use it for on serious stuff, negative stuff, try and use it for positive things as well. Trying to be of value to people, sharing. So I have my blog. Um, so alongside Microsoft, I got an offer from another company and the interview was so smooth. It felt like a conversation because they had gone through my blog prior to the interview. And we were just talking about my blog, how I set it up, the articles I had written, what I learned. So it was it was so smooth, um, although I didn't take your offer, but it was such a smooth interview process with that company because of my blog. So just use the Internet for positive things, try to sh you know share value and be and be of value to people around, I think it helps. I think you make an excellent point there of thinking about your digital profile and using that to position yourself because if you actually do it well and you start to make commentary about what's going on in your industry or on profiles of people that yeah. are speakers in your industry, you might find recruiters even coming to you potentially. Yeah, exactly. um, you know, you're putting stuff out there. So I think that's very, very important. If you had to pick one skill set and it could be technical, it could be non-technical, that you think is so vital um, to develop in preparing yourself for a path like this, what would it be? Uh, <laughs> that's a hard question, but I would pick resilience. Um, yeah, it wasn't easy. It's almost never easy sometimes. Um, yeah. Coming to grad school, rejections, not getting admissions to the school, you were so sure you were getting, not hearing back from schools in time, not getting funding. For some people, visa denials. Um, so I think resilience is a very important skill to have in life because life doesn't always go the way we plan or the way we expect. There are a few obstacles here and there from time to time. Um, so I think resilience is something I would pick. I mean, every other skill, yeah. can be learned like technical skills can always be built by taking courses practicing doing projects but even to finish a course you still need resilience because sometimes you maybe you're facing a bug for two weeks <laughs> so yeah i would say resilience yeah and i finishing the course demonstrates something as well right it shows yeah. that you can push through and finish what you started and i think like you were saying you know you're resilient if you send out you know 10 emails or contacts and your conversion rate is like 10 percent one person gets back to you but if that goes up to 20 obviously your conversion rate goes up so the more you put into the funnel even though you're not going to get everything out of the funnel the yeah. more potentially it can come out in terms of results so resilience yeah, absolutely would agree with that um, so let's talk more about what you actually do as a data scientist, because data science is one of those roles that people often say depends on the company you're in, what your day-to-day -day role involves, are you more analytics, are you more predictive, are you, you know, can we talk a little bit more, and you could start off from your internship and more into 
um, your, your first internship in Nigeria and move more into your internship now, if you want to give us some sort of like taster of what are people potentially doing day to day? What are the interactions like? What are the problems like? What does that look like? And what can give you an idea whether it's something that you will potentially enjoy um, as a career path? Okay. Okay, um, so prior to coming to grad school last year, I had worked in Nigeria for three years. So after doing the internship with my first company, Dems Analytics, I grew to a junior data scientist and I was promoted at the company. Um, for that, I was working on natural language processing, text analysis, recommendation systems. Um, so the, plot, the company had a content generation platform and the kind of work I did was trying to recommend articles to users based on similar articles that they had read and enjoyed reading. Um, also recommend, recommending articles to users based on what similar people to them enjoyed reading. Yeah, so that's content-based recommendation system. That was very <laughs> facebook <-y. laughs> I mean, you can also look at it like Netflix, you know, Netflix, Amazon, you'll see. You yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's where recommendation systems are applied. I really enjoyed it. I really like it. I think I will go back to doing that soon. It's something I really just like doing. Um, so my second role was with Stairs, Stairs Business, a news platform that, that um, publishes news about Nigeria and African data and financial and finances and economy. For that, the role was more product facing. So we had a we have a subscription based platform. So I was doing more data analytic, data analysis or data analytic tasks, um, trying to see how users were engaging with the platform, where we were losing users from, how we could increase revenue and stuff like that. So it was very product facing with more meetings to management and reporting of numbers. So business intelligence, data analysis, presentation to management. That was what my role typically was for years. And then I came to grad school and now I'm doing an internship in Microsoft and I work on the Bing team. So Bing is the search engine. Again, I'm back to text data and I'm doing, I'm back to doing like natural language processing and text analysis at my internship. Ah, and you spoke about doing some analytics work during your internship as well. And this is actually a question I get people ask a lot, like what part is booming more, has more opportunities? Should they go more data analytics or more data science? What do you think about that? Yeah, I think it depends on where you are. So in a developing country, you may not have as many data science roles um, or get to do as many data science intense tasks just because data science it needs a lot of data and not many companies in developing countries right now have that much data. Um, so your, your role may be more towards data analysis, data visualization, or even data engineering. Data engineering is building the pipeline to actually get this data or study this data. So your role may be more towards those or software engineering for people for some people as well um so in a developing country you might not have many data science in quotes focused roles and tasks as you would like but in developed countries they're like big tech companies and there's just more there's just access to more data um so i think it depends on where you are in your role and it's i think it's okay to start with something on ground like okay you don't see the science rules i think it's okay to start with data engineering because it's gets your foot in the door or data analysis or software engineering or whatever thing you you know you find to do i think it's okay to start with something because you can always you're building experience you're building your network and you can always make the switch if you decide to and who knows you might actually just like the other part <laughs> mm, true taking a step back you have the advantage of being technical in your undergrad your computer yeah. science graduate so what if a person isn't technical? Um, would that you know, change your advice? Do you think one route is more technical than the other? Does it matter? Um, what do you think uh, the differences might be for someone if they're coming from a non-technical background? Okay. I think it doesn't really depend on where you're coming from, but more about who you are and your interest. So let's say you didn't do it an undergrad in CS, you did it in something else, maybe arts and humanities. That's fine, but if you're interested in actually building these technical skills, you can sign up for a short course, you can join a boot camp, you can use online courses and actually develop the skills that you feel you're lacking in. So I don't think where you're coming from or what you studied previously should determine where you're going 
if you decide that, oh, I, some of us, some people did computer science and are not working in technical roles, and that's fine as well. Um, I think it's more about who you are, what you're interested in, what you think comes easy to you and you're highly skilled at, because technical skills can be built. I was, I don't think I was born with them. I don't think I was born with it. I built it by going to school and learning and studying and you can do the same as well. I mean, it might take longer for you because you probably have to brush up on a few things that those that did CS in, in uni have learned already. But I think that's fine. It's not a race, a sprint. Um, so you can just take the time, brush up on the knowledge you think you're missing out on and start applying. And I think it would work out for you. Yeah, I think one of the key skills for the future is people sort of teaching themselves on to, to how to learn, basically teaching yourself to learn new skills and new things very quickly because the technology has changed so rapidly. Yep. Um, you know, when iOS, you know, development started, nobody had that skill. Somebody had to learn it and then it became a, something in demand. So I think just being adaptive to learning new skills and picking up things quickly is, is, is a very desirable skill for the future. So yeah. thinking more long-term then, like there's things like, you know, auto ML, for example, how do you think the landscape might evolve for the future? Like, you know, do you think it's going to be valuable to get something like a PhD to accelerate your career in this field? Where do you see things evolving across the sphere? Okay, I'm laughing because almost everyone is convinced that I will get a PhD. <laughs> well, you, were, you were supposed to be a doctor first, so it wouldn't be completely unrealistic. <laughs> I mean, the title is nice, so I don't know. Currently, I don't think so, but I, I, I don't know, right? Tomorrow, things might change. Yeah. I think we ought to ML as it is with life. You know, computers came and it felt like, oh my God, nobody's going to need people to type and everything. So automation comes, technology, you know, evolves. I think what's best for us is either to be the ones building these tools. So now there are lots of tech jobs that are building computers, building software for computers and building phones and stuff like that. So either be, you know, position yourself to build these tools or position yourself to get the skill you need to work efficiently with the tools. So before Microsoft Excel, I don't know, we're probably taking notes of paper, you know, writing tables with pen and paper and drawing, you know, I don't really know how that works. But we're probably adding by ourselves, like with our head or something on paper. And Microsoft Excel came and they probably said, oh, accountants are going to be out of job because Microsoft Excel is here. But how to position yourself is either you're building Microsoft Excel, building for Microsoft Excel, so maybe macros and stuff like that, or you're working with Microsoft Excel to be more efficient. So accountants, bankers using Excel to create reports and things like that. About the PhD, <laughs> I think it depends on who you are and what you want. So currently, I really enjoy working in the industry because I like to apply directly and have a clear goal in a short period of time. But research is more about finding out what, what works or what doesn't work. And most times it's not been done before. And it's very long term. I'm actually doing research currently for my master's because it's a thesis program. So I'm having a bit of research and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm comparing, you know, this internship versus the research, which do I enjoy? If I end up enjoying my research more, I can go ahead to do a PhD, but currently industry is winning. Uh, but for research, definitely, sometimes it's good for your career if you want to grow in a certain area. Some roles require having a PhD. If you want to be like a subject matter expert, it might be helpful to have a PhD. Um, Again, don't just have a PhD because maybe it feels like the right thing to do at the time or everyone is doing it. Or it, seems, it seems cool. I think you should have a clear goal of, oh, I want to do research in this area and actually deep dive into that area to learn more about it or to figure out the limitations or to invent something. I think that gives a PhD more meaning because it's not easy. It is not easy at all. It's so hard, so difficult, but people do it, but you want to do it for the right reasons so that your stress is worth it. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of work. What, what are you doing your um, researching for your master's at the moment? Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah. Okay. Um, again, you spoke about learning to learn and everything. I'm actually open to exploring different areas. So for my master's, I'm doing my research in artificial intelligence and human robotic interaction. Prior to coming to grad school, I had never done robotics before. <laughs> so it was a steep learning curve for me. 
But basically what I do is write code or write software for robots that make robots act intelligently. And in my own, like my own field is narrowed down to robots interacting with humans. So an example could be computer vision. So if I'm walking, I want the robot to see me walking and follow me, that's an example. Or if um, I'm talking, I want the robot to hear what I'm saying understand what I'm saying and actually speak back to me. Yeah, so that's my research is in. I love this space. I, I <laughs> just finished, I just finished a, um, a program at Cornell myself. I got to work with this amazing professor, Wendy Ju, and I did a lot of interactive device design where we're studying the interactions between humans and robots. Obviously there's a technical aspect of actually making the computer vision work and the yeah. machine work, but there's also trying to make the interaction realistic and, yeah. and you know, expectations and it's very okay. interesting yeah. space of it. Um, yeah. That's cool. That's cool. You. you also spoke about the fact that business is currently winning. And I know it's, it's something a lot of data scientists often say, the reason why they're attracted to that career path is the impacts that they see themselves making in the business. And that can be very rewarding. So for you, what is making business win for you at the moment? Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so prior to coming to grad school, I worked at startups in Lagos, so it was startups. And the thing with startups, it's very fast-paced, one. Two, you can directly see the impact of what you're doing, almost in real time, because it's fast-paced. So let's say I'm running an A-B experiment, and it goes live last week. I can, I mean, even planning the experiment, so we conceptualize the experiment, let's say at the start of the month, by end of the month, it's gone live, you know, production, I'm seeing it. <laughs> and then the results are back and I can analyze the data and actually give recommendations to the product team or to the growth team or to the marketing team or to management. So that really made me feel very impactful and I could see how my work and decisions I recommended could what was influencing the business positively, hopefully. Um, moving to a big tech, it's a bit different for me because one is a bigger company. I mean, I haven't even met everybody in my organization, talk less of the entire company. And um, yes, yeah, so it's something I'm adjusting to. But one thing I would say is trying to still be relevant no matter how little. So yesterday I had a presentation within my organization, which is like my team, my wider team, about um, a script I had written to abstract something we were doing manually before and also publishing a documentation. So the impact may not be as big as it was in a startup, you know, seeing the numbers or seeing revenue directly. And I'm like, yes, you know, but trying to solve problems for people, problems that have existed already or new problems for people around you, trying to make someone's life easier, your coworkers' life easier. Okay, maybe this thing takes so long to deploy or to build. What can I do to speed up, you know, this, um, what can I do to speed up, you know, this process? So looking for the little things you can do to make your team more efficient or someone's work easier will still give you that impact. That's what I'm learning. I think it's great that you've had the opportunity to actually in so in your in your short career so far you've worked in a startup and now you're working you know in essentially a fang and yeah. so you can see the differences in being a data scientist as well I think that's phenomenal experience and exposure um so for you then you know having this experience where do you think the most exciting places in industry lie in applying data science to and that can come from obviously like a big tech or startup, but it can also come, I'm quite interested in hearing your thoughts on industry silos, like for example, FinTech or you know blockchain or health tech, et cetera. Where do you see uh, the most exciting for you from your perspective and why? Okay, I'm biased. <laughs> that was <laughs> fine. Yeah, I think I have two answers. Um, one, maybe three. <laughs> okay, I'll just give a list. So fintech won because people send money every day. So I can imagine the amount of data they have. Uh, but I think that's one of the downsides to applying machine learning or data science in a field. You might not see data or have enough data. I think if you're a data scientist, it's percent of your work, maybe not 18. That's a random number. It's actually looking for data. It's such a thing. Um, so fintech have the data on their farms if they are logging properly because people send money at least every i think every day people send money even if it's one naira or one dollar people are sending money um and i also go with i don't know if it's to call it social media 
we talk a lot <laughs> every day on Twitter. We are tweeting, you know, not everybody, but people tweet. You know, there's a lot of user generated content out there on the internet. Although it can be used for negative things, but I think if you have good intentions and you're handling people's private data correctly and not using it for malicious intent, I think that's also a good place that this science can be applied. I think even for people that are trying to learn or get into the industry, it's like the social media field is open. There's lots of open data out there as far as you're um, you know, following the compliance and data protection regulations you can get data from these places and actually try out interesting projects like okay this musician just released an album what are people saying about it how is it looking in different countries or we have maybe the world cup coming up or this event you know do some analysis about it and try to make some predictions i mean football champions league and all those things so i think social media or the entertainment space user generated content is also something and when i'm when i said i'm biased i'll say health tech I don't think there's a lot of data in health tech in health tech currently and it's also more difficult to track data because it's more personal um but i i don't have the best you know eyesight and it's something i always said oh i want to find a way to like use machine learning or ai or data science to help improve you know vision like human vision because it's something that's personal to me um i mean i mean, need a phd for that <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I see a lot of activity in that space. Like I saw someone doing a retina uh, AI ML sort of platform. There's lots of stuff in. And I think it also depends on the markets as well. Um, like you said, is the, the data does exist, but are people actually collecting it? Has it been digitized? Because if that step hasn't happened in the process, then you can't yeah. do all this like funky data AI ML stuff at yeah. the end. So the stages to, to development. Now we've spoken a lot about some of the exciting aspects of being a data scientist. What do you think are some of the more challenging aspects and things to just be aware of and prepare yourself for? Okay, um, first one is it's a very fast paced field. So every day that, maybe not every day, there's always something new, new papers to read, new research to catch up on. Every, there's always something new and it can get overwhelming sometimes and like information overload and things like that. I think the second thing is aligning, aligning with you know the company you work for. That's a thing that I don't know if it's spoken about often, but it's such a thing. So data science is you um, using data to make predictions or to make recommendations. If you, the place you work, the company you work for, the products you're working on, is not aligned with your personal values, I think that's something you should reconsider and don't feel obligated to maybe pander the data to fit a narrative or to do anything that is not um, honest. So I think that's the second thing, you know, you have to be aware of your personal values, your core values, and make sure that you're upholding them even at the workplace. Um, I think the third thing is getting data. So yeah, your entire career is hinged upon data. Um, if for some reason there isn't data anymore or the data is compromised, it can affect like your analysis, your model, your prediction and everything. So I think getting data is something that is a challenge. People are trying to solve it. It's a whole career on its own to create data, like source for data, aggregate data, validate data. Um, but I think those are, those are some of the challenges of being a data scientist. Yeah, I think this space is going to be very interesting how it evolves. Like Europe has a lot more regulatory control and is really doing a lot, especially to, you know, unfortunately, fan companies that hold data about people, the privacy aspects, the governance around that, even yeah. targeted advertising, how, how is that going to change for the future? With so I think that's a really interesting space because even though it's a challenge, it's going to bring some opportunities as well, right? Yeah. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. Um, yeah. So coming back to, like, you spoke at the beginning of the conversation about how you went about trying to find, um, you know, a university in the States to go to. And I'm just thinking for those that might be in that position as well, um, and, you know, they know nothing about this process, how did you decide, oh, Denver is a good place to go? Or how did you, you know, was there a process to you shortlisting universities? Yeah. Um, was there any particular resource that was particularly useful in bridging the gap for you? Just any nuggets you can drop to help would be very valuable. Okay, um, thanks for that. I think you asking that question has actually um, given, given me an idea on what next to publish because it's sometimes, sometimes we underestimate things we do 
or just take it for granted, but sharing it may actually be of help to someone. So when I decided I, want to go to, I wanted to go to grad school, I decided in 2019 and I was trying ahead of 2020 before the pandemic happened. Um, so I chose like countries I wanted to go to that offered the courses I wanted to do. I didn't look at Nigeria because the field like I wanted to do my master's in wasn't really a thing then in Nigeria, in Nigerian academic institutions. Um, so I applied to schools in 2020 and I got admissions in some admissions in some, but I didn't get funding. And I realized that for most, not all, most schools, especially in North America, to get funding, you know, they expect you to do some research or thesis. I don't really like research. So I was like, no, I'm not doing research. So I was applying to like course-based masters and it was harder for me to find funding. And then the pandemic happened and there was so much uncertainty. I was working for stairs. They were so nice to me during the pandemic. They took care of me. They cared, they cared about my well-being, and I felt at peace. So I didn't do grad school in 2020. I continued working, I continued working with them. Then I tried again by the end of 2020 to begin in 2021 and thank God it worked out and I came to grad school. So the process I, I went through was first deciding what I wanted to study. So what area, what do I want to do a generalized masters or a specialized masters? I decided to do a generalized masters. My masters is in computer science. Some people are surprised when I tell them they expected me to do a master's in data science, um, but I'm still very young. This field is still evolving and who knows tomorrow I might decide to be an AI or a roboticist. So I didn't want to like box myself too early. I mean, for my, if I decide to do a PhD, for my PhD, I can go more specialized. But I decided to have a generalized uh, master's just to get the CS experience in a developed country and to, you know, widen my opportunities. So yeah, I opted for a generalized master's, but I was focusing more on the research interest and the research area. So I'm doing a master's in computer science with research focus on AI and human robotics interaction. Um, so yeah, so I decided the course first of all, and I started looking for schools that offered the course I wanted with funding because it was so important to me. The exchange rate is not the best right now and my Naira couldn't fund my schooling here. So I was looking for schools with funding. I considered different countries, not only the US, Canada, UK, um, and I applied to schools as well. So I had this spreadsheet, which I think I might share. I mean, I've been sending it to people that reach out to me privately. I will send it to their email, but I'm actually putting it on my blog. So I had a spreadsheet that um, I had list of schools and I made different things. So location, weather, black community, safety, fees, you know, I put the deadlines there as well, scholarships and every any funding opportunities and different criteria I used to measure these schools. And I weighted them because some were not so important to me as others, like funding was number one. <laughs> um, language as well, I really wanted an English speaking country because I've been trying to learn French for like 10 years now and maybe language is not just my thing. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I like to visit these countries, but do I want to leave them when I'm not very good at learning languages? I wasn't sure. You know, so you know, I waited these different criteria, and um, I I had like a list of schools, but I submitted applications to four schools. Yeah, so I took the top four and I sent in my application. So when I chose the top four, I went through their admission page very carefully, writing down everything that was expected of me. Those that they said were mandatory and not mandatory. Like some schools would say, "Oh, GRE is not." compulsory but I wrote GRE I was like nope I need to put in the extra work you know to stand out so I wrote everything and then I started saving money as well because this thing is expensive you have to apply for transcripts I had to evaluate my degree because the, the balance the scale system is different I had to pay for these exams some of them are quite expensive um, so yeah I also started saving money from my work and putting my application package together I also worked on a personal project to show that because I was applying to research, you know, courses and research programs. So I worked on a personal project, you know, from conceptualization till the end. And I compared different machine learning models just to show that I had some research experience um, as well as my undergraduate you know, thesis project. So when I put together, okay. Wow. Okay. Okay. You've not finished. Keep going. Keep so, going. Yeah, so when I put together, I'm almost, when I put together my application package, I made sure that you know I knew when they were starting to take applications and I sent my applications early and waited to hear back. So yeah, that's it. I was just gonna say you've pretty much built like a little model 
to just evaluate your decisions. And then it sounds like it's almost a recommendation engine <laughs> oh my God. To, to basically tell you, put, put the data in and I'll tell you which universities you should, you should consider applying at. Consider, right? You yeah, know, you know, what's most important to you and I recommend schools to you based on that. Exactly. Like, that. <laughs> it's all the boxes of all the things you're interested in. You should put that on your blog. We'll put a link in the show notes to direct people there, but sounds brilliant. I, I love it. Um, so for you, who, what people or books or ideas have been the most influential and so far in your life or career and, and why? Hmm. Okay, I'll group them, you know, in three. So I would say the first set is my family. So my parents and my sisters. My parents first because they paid for my education. I was privileged to get, you know, we had the family computer at, at a young age for me and I got my first laptop at about 16 years. So having those privileges, you know, sacrificing and giving me the resources, not just money, time, values, encouragement, you know, they never let me think that, I cannot or should not do something because I'm a girl or I'm a woman. It just never came up. I mean, anything you want to do, do as far as is right and in line with your values that they had, you know, trained you with. Um, so yeah, my parents, they really influenced the kind of person that I am today. And I think I owe a lot, a huge, you know, percentage of who I am to them. And my sisters as well, my sisters have always been very encouraging. If I ever need anything, they're going to look around them for me or share things that I do, support me. When I, so I went through uni, trying out different businesses. I tried to make wigs at some point. I tried to make bags. I tried to sew. I've always, I've tried my hands at a lot of things. And my sisters will always buy from me. They don't need a bag, but oh, you're making a bag. All right, make for me. And they will pay me. They don't have to. You know, so they've always supported me with their money, their time, their encouragement, and just believing in me. So that's the first set. And the second set, I would say is um, Udeme. Udeme is my friend. And he was my first employer. So when I finished school and I didn't have any skills in quotes, I think I was very lucky to start working with him because that's where I, he took me in as a social media associate and he allowed me switch from social media to data science and he paid for my courses. So I think that was very influential. If I didn't work there, if he didn't do all those things for me, I don't know if I would have actually got into data science and been where I am today. So he's the second person I think has been very influential in you know, my career. Now the third group, I like I call them like my support system on my core. So there are people that I mean, it's nice to have all these things, nice to have all the degrees, knowledge, skills, everything, chase all your goals. But I think it's important to have people that you rely on because sometimes it gets difficult, and I come back to them and I cry. So just having them support me, I don't know if I can mention names because I feel like I'll forget someone, and it's not going to be fair to them. Uh, but like people like Valerie Udwak, Akondu, you know, they just support me, Glory and they believe in me and I'm just able to be vulnerable with them so I think those are the three people that have been influential they, you know they keep me in check and keep me balanced and you made incredible points about each category of people but I love to highlight your parents in particular not just because they pay for education but because I think it's important to have people that challenge you so like I remember when you said at the onset they said you know what career path are you going to have is it going to be working in a cyber cafe is yeah. that all you're going to be able to do and I think even having people challenge you like that to make sure that you have done your research and you know what you're considering properly yeah. is a good thing and people shouldn't shy away from having those types of people in their lives so I think that's really cool I'd like, um, like to add something so I think the way they train me is very very good so they let me make my decisions like you know what to study they didn't force me to do medicine even though they would have preferred that but they also try to keep me in check and make sure I'm not making a decision out of youthful exuberance or peer pressure so they would ask me questions like why why do you choose this are you sure have you done this so just and I think I think it has really helped my decision making skills even as an adult and living independently um, I have to ask myself certain questions before I make some decisions even though that's what everyone else is doing so I, I give them credit for that <laughs> love that well Thank done you. and is there anything else that's worth letting our listeners know about your journey we would love to link your blog in the notes I'm sure that would be particularly useful <laughs> Any other tidbits of advice you have for anyone considering technical or non-technical coming into the field that you can share? Okay. Um, I think it's, it's, there's one that you said, I think it really stuck with me, learning to learn. 
I think I don't think there's anything that is impossible to do. Maybe we we got. Um, so if you think this is something you want to do, whatever role it is in tech or even outside of tech, I think you can you can do it. Like give it a try. You might not enjoy it. You might not come so easily to you. You might decide that you don't want to do it, and that's also fine. But please give it a try. And if there's something you really want and you're fighting for, it could be a job, it could be admission, it could be scholarships or funding. Um, please don't give up. You might be facing rejections and it's very, very sad. It hurts so much. Um, it's not the best place to be, but I hope that you can take breaks if you need to and then start again. Take feedback, iterate, implement the feedback, tweak your applications or whatever thing you're sending in and try to you know, be a better version. If there's something you need to learn, if there's a skill you need to pick up, try and pick it up and try again. And who knows, it might just work out. I mean, I faced lots of rejections applying for this internship. And um, at some point I wasn't, I wasn't even getting into the funnel. I think my resume was so bad that I wouldn't get callbacks. <laughs> yeah, but I, I took my resume and then I started getting callbacks for interviews, but then I would fill my interviews. And I realized my interviewing skill was probably not that good. So I had to brush up on that. I signed up for mock interview sessions and um, try to like take mock interviews and brush up my interviewing skills because sometimes we know these things but we're not just answering we're not just responding the way they expect us to respond I mean the interviewers or whoever you're speaking with or we're not sharing I mean it's one thing to know something in your head it's one thing for the other person to know that you know this thing and you can apply it yeah um, yeah I think that's something that was very helpful to me but I hope that it works out for you know anyone out there that is going through a tough time right now Fantastic. And where is the best place for our listeners to connect and reach out to you to follow up? I know you mentioned your blog. Is there yeah. any other platform that you'd like people to connect on? Okay, yeah, I have my blog, Anya kind of blog. So you can um write drop a comment there and I will respond. I respond to all comments. But I'm also on Twitter at underscore Anya can underscore. Yeah, I just I don't think I say much there. Maybe I do. I don't know. People will say different things. <laughs> No, we'll be sure to link both in the show notes, of course. Once again, Anya Khan, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you this morning. Thanks. Wish you every success at Microsoft and after, whether you do research, whether you stay in business, uh, we know you're going to do great things and we look forward to seeing it. Thank you. So much. Thank you, me, for having me. It was amazing speaking with you.